I wanted to emphasize a few broad points from yesterday's discussion, um, yesterday's coverage, to make sure that they carried across to those who were here and for those who couldn't be here to make clear uh, some of the salient themes, both because I'd like you to walk away with them regardless of whether you can make it, and because it might motivate you to go back and review the lecture on video. Okay. Um, uh, so a few broad themes um, I, I introduced yesterday. I had told you that I'm coming from a certain disciplinary uh, perspective. It is an interdisciplinary perspective. I've been working across the boundaries from computer science now uh, for over 30 years, probably before uh, some of you folks were born. And uh, for 20 years of that, really focused on health applications of computer science and informatics. Um, but I have a particular stance or um, uh, a particular sort of point of view in that, which, uh, which recognizes um, the importance of, uh, of, of data science, but it does so in the context of working with some of the most gnarly problems out there we have to face as a society and as a globe. These wicked problems uh, like you know, uh, global, the global climate change, um, uh, issues having to do with uh, you know, economic injustices, but also problems that confront our, our health and health care systems, which are, which are legion and which are varied in their manifestations. And um, that's the area. The latter is the area in which I've chosen to focus. Um, but it's indicative of a lot of the problems we face as a society. And, and these complex systems, um, to address them effectively, it requires understanding systems as a whole, not purely in terms of their pieces, because they are at a technical level complex in the sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So you can't understand them simply by taking them apart into pieces, you know, understanding each piece, and then thinking that that's going to give you an understanding of the system as a whole. Any more so that you can understand traffic jams by being a real expert in car engines and car tires and axles. To understand traffic jams takes a lot more than understanding the details of cars, but the details of cars are are important because if cars break down, you know, every five minutes, you, you've got a lot of traffic jams. So understanding these complex phenomena, these emergent phenomena, requires an understanding not only of the pieces, but an integrative ability to piece those together to understand how their interactions affect the system as a whole. And that's different than understanding the pieces. Now, when it comes to, um, to the enterprise of understanding those systems, it's my conviction that data science plays an absolutely key role the insights we can secure from empirical data are absolutely central for allowing us to reliably understand, reason about, and effectively manage, make decisions in these complex systems. But, but that lends me a certain stance with respect to data science that, that, that lends a certain unity to the different data sets we're collecting, recognizing that they're not springing full born out of the world each in isolation as a solitude, like Athena from Zeus's head, but instead that they're coming from common underlying systems which, by which they're related. They're close cousins of each other. They're different faces of a common underlying system. And understanding things in one data set can often give you a lot of understanding to another. And there's a certain amount of our work, say, in conversion <coughs> cross-mapping methods that, that, where that's a central theme. But it came out yesterday in the sense that we were reasoning about underlying systems generating the patterns that we see in data sets, where more than one data set might come from the same underlying <coughs> system. And I argued yesterday that reasoning about the underlying systems to give rise to that data the data generating processes is of key importance because 
Whilst the data that we collect gives us great insight into those systems, often in the human condition, we're, we're interested more than being detached observers from these systems. We're interested in intervening, bending things for the better, bending the curves of public health towards greater health, bending, bending the situations associated with community safety and well-being towards occurrences of less domestic violence and, and uh, reduced risk of, of opioid addiction, et cetera. <coughs> We're interested in making a difference. And when we want to make a difference, we have to realize that we're talking about altering the underlying system. We're intervening in it. And we're intervening in a way that alters it, such that it alters the data generating process. And, and that's going to throw off some statistical regularities that we may have been looking at with the data, some associations, some correlations. And I argue to do this reliably requires something that's just coming to the fore, ladies and gentlemen, with data science. To wit, causal reasoning. Reasoning about causation. It is that causal reasoning that helps us reason about counterfactuals. This is a hot new area of, of data science, but it's one that's occupied me for the past 30 years since I wore a very younger man's shoes between my undergrad and graduate years at MIT, and I first started getting into <coughs> complex systems. And when it comes to the prospect of data science, it requires an appreciation for how these, how these uh, different pieces of the system, statistical patterns we observe are contention on that data generating process, and the ability to be open to modeling, whether it's statistical or dynamical, as we saw yesterday, that captures causality. Why capture causality? Well, I'll tell you one of the big reasons people seek to, cause, to capture causality these days. It's for explainability. What is going on in this underlying system? Having something more than a black box, but something that, that posits connections that can be explained to a clinician or to someone who's, who's an expert <coughs> in a, a health system or to someone who understands psychology. And that's attracted a lot of attention. But there's other things as well. There's attribution. Why do we see these phenomena? And I would argue, arguably, the most importantly, there's being able to reason about counterfactuals. If we do X, how will it change the situation? And to reason about this, we need models that are up to it. Judea Pearl has articulated and some wonderful, um, wonderful uh, uh, contributions coming out of uh, UCLA, uh, a very cohesive causal modeling framework by which positive causal relationships, as first recognized by Sewell Wright, for example, in the early 1900s, um, in terms of statistical significance, um, are laid out in a very systematic theory with guidance as to how to quantify the, the, the strength of connections within those causal frameworks. Yesterday, I showed you dynamic modeling state-space modeling, which captures causality in the form of dynamic models. And ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to be continuing on that some this afternoon. This morning, we will also see the use of models. And all of these models that I'm showing you yesterday, this afternoon, and in this lecture indeed, capture theory. how things are connected in the model. And in many cases, they do so in a causal fashion. I wanted to big emphasis today, which is more observational understanding, excuse me, this morning, but this afternoon it'll come roaring back. So yesterday we saw how we could mesh theory captured in dynamic models with machine learning approach in the form of particle filtering to bring the two together. And it brought together dynamic models with incoming data, Data, for example, screened from various sources incrementally in a way that gave the best of both worlds, in the way that 
that corrects for the model or, or clues it into to stochastics in the system. They may be taking the system in a different direction so that it's always dealing with an up-to-date understanding of what's the current situation and by extension through the power of the model, where is this going and what might come next and you know, um, uh, what might be the trade-offs between different interventions if I undertook them now. So really, at, at a big level, that's what particle filter is about. And there's an earlier methods from the 1950s, uh, uh, Rudolf Kalman in a remarkable contribution uh, to find the Kalman filter, which was the first big step, big leap in that direction, but was encumbered by many, many restrictions that the particle filter relaxes. Okay? And the significance of what we saw yesterday is profound because it's really about a wholesale meshing of system science, the ability to reason about complex systems and represent those complex systems in a theory-rich way with data science. And I'm a big believer in other ways of bringing the two together, including with theory-based models and some non-theory-based models capturing certain regularities <coughs> of the deep learning models. Um, so I took a stance yesterday, and you'll see that continue today. But the methods yesterday were fundamentally about representing systems using a theory-based ma method and using particle filtering, this, this computational statistical approach, to mesh that theory-based model with incoming data in a way that corrected it, allows us to estimate the underlying state, project forward what's going to happen probabilistically, and ask a lot of questions. That's really what yesterday was about. We saw a certain type of data. I promised I'm going to try in each lecture to introduce you to a little bit of novel data sources as well as to talk about machine learning and perhaps to give a bit of philosophy. And yesterday I, I showed you search data and indeed that figured prominently in one of the examples, an example associated with H1N1 flu outbreaks in Manitoba and in uh, Quebec. So that was yesterday. Um, we saw particles. The particle filter worked through particles, and each particle represented a sample from an underlying distribution. But it wasn't a sample that can be taken in isolation as that value in isolation. Not all samples were equal. Some samples, all samples had weights associated with them, and some of those weights were higher than others. A, a weight of 1 versus a weight of 0.5 indicates, I'll say a weight of 0.5 versus 0.25 indicates that one with 0.5 sort of counts twice as much in the underlying distribution as the one with 0.25. And we saw that we could run these dynamic models with these swarms of particles. It was almost an ensemble method where each particle represented a different hypothesis about what's going on in the underlying system. And we're running the simulation model, we'll be running in this ensemble of different hypotheses as to what's going on. And at any one time, there's a distribution implied by those hypotheses. Um, but we always sample from that distribution, sample from the particles, the samples, in a way that the probability of getting a given sample is proportional to its weight. So yesterday, we. We had all this buzzing, blooming confusion associated with, with uh, these different things, search data, you know, search volume data, dynamic models, particle filter method, etc. And I hope you'll take away those broad outlines of what I was trying to communicate. Because it's pointing you in many ways to the very important line direction in which data science is is moving, which is dealing explicitly in a fundamental way with causality. Okay. Right on the front. Okay. Um, I'd like to open this uh, to ask, are there any questions about yesterday's material that I can answer? I, I put up some, some slides yesterday which had uh, which had points of note and conclusions. I'll put them out there if anyone wants to uh, use them to ask uh, questions or stimulate your memory of what I talked about. 
questions I can answer. Wait, I don't mean you could maybe you could make a couple comments in terms of wicked problems, because I think it's probably new to sure. Sure. Um, I'm not going to be able to do it justice. Um, it's not a term I use a huge amount, but I will give you the essence of it. Wicked problems are a subclass of complex problems, of problems involving um, uh, complex systems. When I say complex here, it's important to note I'm not speaking about systems that are merely complicated, of lots of moving parts. I'm speaking about systems that are complex in a, in a technical sense, in a sense that the behavior of the whole cannot be, is not the same as the average or sum of the behavior of the, of the different pieces. Okay? Um, and complexity is associated most specifically with nonlinearity in the underlying system. When we have a function that's nonlinear, and we have a, a, a evolving system, a dynamic system that's nonlinear. Um, we we can't analyze it nearly as easily as with a linear system. With a linear system, we can take we can understand how the system will behave with respect to intervention A and intervention B together by understanding how it behaves with each in isolation and then just sum off the total. Is anyone here from engineering background? Good man. Um, okay, so um, have have folks here seen Fourier transforms before? A little bit. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, they're starting to, to make their way into to other domains. Uh, back when I was young, I know you think the world was still cooling then, but um, uh, when I was young, the uh, uh, engineering was the main place you'd see Fourier transforms. Plus, plus of course our cognate mathematicians. Um, but in Fourier transforms, the idea is to understand, well, often it's used in engineering to say, OK, we have this system here. And we have a, a signal, an input, uh, something that's you know, going into this system. To figure out how the system's going to behave on that input, all we have to do is take the input apart into pieces. In this case, they're sinusoids. We, we know how the system will behave with respect to each of those sinusoids. And so by extension, we know how the system behaves with respect to the whole because it's a linear time invariant system. And so we, we, we take the, the input apart into pieces. We know how the system will behave with respect to each of them. And we just sum up those responses to get the output for the system as a whole. And with nonlinear systems, that doesn't work. It works for nice linear, linear systems, linear time invariant systems. But with nonlinear systems, it doesn't work. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay? And um, these systems are rife. They are typical in the domain of human, human activity, human theater. And they have to do with systems that are surprising. They blow back to us. This is why you know, we, can't, we can't make easy policy with respect to a lot of things, because we are surprised by the results. We think, oh, if we intervene in this way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to yield this result. But in complex systems, the results of that intervention are delayed often. They are nonlinear, so just a little bit more intervention yields a tipping point, for example. Take with vaccine vaccination. Um, that totally changes the situation. We don't have ways of intuitively reasoning about it. The effects are distal in time often, so delay, but distal in space or within the system where they pop out. So we intervene here and it pops out there. We change doctors' prescription policies with respect to opioids, and suddenly we have police responding to all these opioid deaths. We, we restrict what doctors can prescribe on opioids. The patients who have been counting on opioids to feed a, a, a hidden addiction can't get their drugs through their physicians anymore. They go to the street to get them. They get less controlled opioids from dealers, adulterated opioids. They only got them episodically, and so the tolerance is going up and down. And chances are within, you know, good chance within six months to a year, they will overdose. And so you have to be over here in health, and it pops out over here in social services and justice, corrections, and policing. This is the nature of complex systems. 
we try to manage them in ways we're used to managing linear systems, and we get we get policies that encounter what's called policy resistance. They are diluted or defeated or even reversed in their effects because we're dealing with complexity. We're dealing with surprising effects. And for this reason, we, we build models and we try to reason about these systems. And we ground those models with data science. Those are complex systems. Now, a subpart of complex systems deals with wicked problems. We have complex problems, which are a broader set, and then we have wicked problems. And wicked problems are particularly societally gnarly. They can't be addressed through any one discipline. They can't be addressed through um, merely traditional incremental means. They require a wholesale rethinking about the methods we use. They require creation of, an, of, of new methods to, to, to effectively grapple with them, just as building giant engineering projects. In engineering, we talk about mega projects in civil engineering. Projects like the Hoover Dam that required a whole industry to be created in, a, in, a new, in, a, in an area that was desert in order to build this dam, okay? Um, and you know, similarly with the pyramids or something like that. These, these are, are large scale endeavors to address wicked problems, but more deeply, wicked problems require us as a society to grapple with our values. What is it that's important? Let's say with opioids. What are we trying to do with opioids? Are we trying to reduce drug addiction? Are we trying to reduce drug addiction that leads to disorder, to people who can't lead their lives productively, whose families fall apart, can't keep jobs, um, are just constantly craving this drug in a way that's completely debilitating for their relationships and their ability to function? Is that what we're trying to prevent with uh, talking about lowering the harm of opioids? Is it that we're trying to stop opioid deaths from occurring? You know, would we be happy if we could feed everyone who's addicted to opioid now opioids for the rest of their life? They're, they stay addicted, but they um, are disordered and uh, and they're unable to work because of that. Um, but they're alive. Or uh, alternatively, if we could keep them alive in a functional way by administering them heroin injections every day, as is done on an experimental basis, for example, in, in some programs in BC. If we could have everyone who's, who's opioid addicted come in for a heroin addiction every day, and they lead a quite functional life, they go off to work after it and, and work through the day, which is what happens for large classes of patients, would that be an acceptable solution to us as a society? Or for climate change, you know, um, what are our fundamental values we're trying to realize? And, and wicked problems are associated with conflicts in those values. They're associated with challenges for defining what is a good solution that require a lot of deep thinking. And there's quite a few problems like this. You know, problems of pollution and, and the ocean, um, for example, uh, to, to mention one, another one that's, that's very prominent. These are problems which gnaw at us as a society, which, which expose societal divisions which are complex, but where the terms of reference, the terms by which we think about them, are themselves contested. <coughs> and we're trying to do something to fix this problem, which is, is difficult in the first place because it's complex and because our interventions yield weird outcomes. But meanwhile, we've got this, this dissonance going on and, and even how to describe it or, or or what we're after that, that's got to be dealt with. And some of humanity's most pressing problems are of this sort. Nuclear weapons or, you know, and nuclear, actually the whole, the whole set of issues involving nuclear power and, and um, you know, proliferation, nuclear weapons, you know, it's, it's another whole, whole area. Um, and uh, another, another area where wicked problems arise. And there's a lot of these in today's society that dominate, you know, a lot of our, our generational challenges. So, so those, those are some comments on wicked problems, but you can 
find far more articulate observers than I who can, who can give a better definition. Okay? Okay. Great question. Other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here with you to, to share your attention. And uh, uh, I would welcome questions at any point, okay? I recognize that the material that I'm covering has many different challenges for different people in the room. Please speak up if there is something I can do to address that. But if there's no, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more time. Any questions that I can answer right now before we move on to the substantive material? this one. So I think we'll move on. I will cease this recording and I will um, begin the recording um, which, uh, which deals with our subject